Hi, everyone. Uh, really quickly, just to kind of get an idea of my audience, is there anyone here, like a show of hands, that does not use Postgres today? A few people, and everyone else does? Show of hands of people that do. Okay, you're my people, the other people, I'll convince you. Um, so really quickly, who am I? Uh, I run a fully managed database as a service at Citus Data. We turn Postgres into a horizontally scalable distributed database under the, the covers. Um, I curate Postgres Weekly, so it's similar to like Python or PyCoders Weekly. Uh, if you like Postgres or want to learn a little bit more, it's more focused on app dev and not DBA, so um, if you're a developer, consider subscribing. I blog a good bit about Postgres, tech, that sort of things. Uh, previously, I was at Heroku. I launched the Python support there like seven years ago, then I hired Kenneth to run it well. Um, most of my time there, I ran Heroku Postgres. So I've been running Postgres on top of AWS for north of seven years now, which has been uh, some days good and some days absolutely horrible. Uh, so what I'm gonna drill into today is things you can think about and how do you manage your database at various levels of scale. Like how do you start small, how do you grow, um, what do you optimize at what stage, and let's start at the really, really kind of itty bitty stage. So the first thing, uh, this was actually said by someone uh, famously in the Rails community, that the, the database is just a dumb hash in the sky. Um, I treat it very, very differently, and especially Postgres. Why do I treat Postgres differently? Uh, this is a quote from a coworker, um, but it sums it up really, really well. Like Postgres is becoming more of a data platform than just a relational database. Um, it's not just about some tables and joins. We have a lot more in there. We've got a ton of different data types. If you look at the manual, there's around 100 data types within your database. Uh, it's got really rich geospatial features. Um, it's well regarded as the most advanced open source geospatial database. So if you're doing anything geospatial and you don't want to go pay Oracle or ArcGIS, Postgres is what you're going to be using. It's got a really rich set of index types. Um, every year, there's kind of a new index type in Postgres. Most databases have one or two index types. Postgres is getting a new one every year, which has you know, really unique and special use cases, depending on what you're doing. There's full text search. Uh, there's JSONB. So this is actually you know, one, I think, of people's favorite features when they discover it. Uh, it's a full binary representation of JSON in your database. So you can have document store uh, with things like gen indexes. You can index every single column or every single uh, key and value within it. Um, query directly into it, just like you were using Mongo or something like that. And then it has you know, full transactional semantics, you can join against it, all that sort of thing. So really powerful. So at small scale, where do you start? Uh, the first thing I would say is data types. Um, this is something the, the Python community does pretty well, but make sure you leverage the data types that are there. Um, I find early on people just throw a bunch of things in text and say, oh, I'll let, you know, figure it out later. Um, having Good usage of your data types allows you to set a really, really good foundation. So if you're looking at using Postgres, which you should, um, consider using like JSONB. It's there, you can use it. The argument usually against this is, oh, well, what happens if I need to move my database later? And I've tied into you know, a data type that only exists in Postgres, doesn't exist in MySQL. The problem is you're not getting kind of the full value out of your database at that point. So a few of these, like using Varchar um, instead of just text in the database, it's the exact same thing but it allows you to actually validate the data that's coming in. So yes, your Python code may be validating and saying, hey, is this string longer than 255 characters? Or is this tweet more than 140, which they should still only be 140 characters? Um, like, you want that validation at the data level, not just the application level as well. Uh, timestamp versus timestamp with TZ. Uh, almost always use timestamp with time zone. So if you connect to it from two different places, it'll actually pick up your time zone, which is really, really useful. Um, you'd be surprised at how complicated times are. Um, some countries and places observe daylight savings time differently. So if you connect from a different place, like that's actually a different time within your database depending on how they observe daylight savings time. You wanna observe this and kind of make sure it's correct in your database. Uh, JSON, so Postgres has two JSON data types. and Postgres 9.2, we got JSON, which is just text that gets validated as it comes in. and Postgres 9.4, we got JSONB. In almost all cases, you want JSONB, so just kind of ignore the JSON type that it exists and use JSONB. Uh, the other thing that you should start early on is constraints. Uh, I find uh, SQL Alchemy is really good about this. Django's pretty good. Um, even when they're not, you wanna have things like foreign key constraints. What happens if you have a user that deletes their account but doesn't delete the, the related orders for that account? 
So you want constraints so that you, know, you get an error there or that you can automatically cascade that delete. Uh, this is really, really key for just referential integrity and in that you don't have weird data later on. Uh, the other thing is I would say master your tools. Um, the most common question I kind of get uh, around Postgres is what's a good editor for it? What's a good GUI? What should I use? And my answer doesn't make a lot of people happy, but it's the command line editor uh, in Postgres, PSQL. Um, how many of you have a bash RC setup or equivalent or a Vim RC? Most people. Um, PSQL has the exact same thing. So you can set up a PSQL RC that's super handy. You can have things like uh, timing is automatically on. I have mine actually set up to save every query I run against every database and record it in the database's names file. And what this means is when someone asks me to run a query, I run the query and they come back later, hey, that query that you ran for me two months ago, can I have it again? And I'm like, I have no idea what I did. Um, so this is actually saved for every single database I connect to without me having to think about it. Really, really handy. Backslash X auto is super useful for auto formatting the output of a query based on your screen width and terminal. Um, so spend time when you're early on, like learn PSQL, master it. Um, it's super useful. So backups. Uh, the other thing is uh, backups, you know, really nice. They'll let you recover your data if something goes wrong. They uh, also allow you to verify like the integrity of your data. Like, as you dump data, it's going to do a full scan of it, make sure there's no corruption, that sort of thing. Uh, but the big thing uh, I find with backups, how many people tested their backups in the last month? So everyone that didn't raise a hand, you probably don't have backups. Like, they don't exist unless you test them. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers the GitLab incident from three or four months ago, where they had five different types of backups. Uh, not just five different copies, but five different methods for backing up. Every single one of them failed. They lost eight hours of data. So unless you've tested your backups, you don't have to do this daily, but monthly, weekly is a good thing. Just spin up an instance, restore it, see that everything works. Otherwise, you don't have backups. So when you're early on, it's pretty easy just to kind of like learn things, spend time, get familiar with Postgres and the tools within it. When you're at a little more medium scale, and I say medium can really vary. This can be 10 gigs of data up to, say, probably 500 gigs of data. Um, so you're getting beyond a hobby project to a real application. The first thing you're going to want to do is configure your system. So set up your logs, configure memory, tweak vacuum, checkpoints, all these sort of things. Basically, don't learn all these things. Uh, that's my, my biggest advice. Uh, a lot of people are like, how do I perfectly tune Postgres? There's a lot of tools that will automatically tune things for you. Um, you'll give it some parameters. It gives you the right Postgres config. There's also a really good talk, PostgreSQL when it's not your day job, by Christoph Pettis. Uh, it was from PyCon two or three years ago. He basically lays out, hey, if you're doing this workload, if you're running on this infrastructure, here's your config. Uh, it's really, really useful. You're going to set this up once and never change it. Uh, the other big thing to pay attention to is your cache. Um, is anyone else aware and excited that DuckTales is coming back? I'm super, I'm super stoked for this, like beyond excited to mostly introduce my children to it. Um, so Postgres has this uh, thing of keeping frequently accessed data in memory. And you can run this really, really simple query uh, to determine what your cache hit ratio is. Um, this is a thing you should just grab, save, keep in, you know, uh, in your Git uh, history somewhere, um, it's going to give you this result. And what this is going to say is 99% of the time, queries were returned from within memory. And the simplest thing to do when you know, things are slow is give it more memory, scale up. That is the easiest thing to do for a small, medium-sized database to give it better performance. Uh, index hit rate is another useful one. So this is a little simpler of a query. And it's giving, giving me back something that looks like this. It's going to give me every table, the percentage of times when I queried that table that it used an index, and the number of rows in the table. Um, here I can do a little bit more heuristics. And like my rough guidelines for almost anyone I talk to, almost any application, and to caveat, this is for OLTP, like web apps, not necessarily for analytics applications. Analy analytical applications, when you're doing like data warehousing BI, it's a very kind of different set of workload and tuning. But I generally, on any database I look at, shoot for 99% cache hit ratio. Uh, and then on any row, any table that has more than 10,000 rows, about a 95% index hit rate. Um, what this means is I'm not scanning every single record on disk, which is going to be much slower. 
So great. Um, that's kind of the high-level metric. Anytime I come to a database, I'm going to look at cache hit ratio and say what it is. Uh, but what happens on a specific query? I've got a page in my application that's really slow. So let's take a, a really quick sample. Like, give me employees that make more than $50,000 a year. Uh, Postgres has this thing called, uh, basically, that when you run a query, there's a query plan for it. Uh, it says, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to join things. Here I'm going to do a sequential scan, filter, that sort of thing. Uh, before any query, you can put explain, and it's going to show you what it thinks it's going to do. Um, having worked with Postgres for north of 10 years now, this is not actually that intuitive even still today. If you run explain analyze, it's going to tell you what it thinks it's going to do, and it's actually going to run the query. So some rough guidelines that I look for, right? Um, you can set these for your own application, but for really, really common queries, I'm usually shooting for less than 10 milliseconds. I just know from enough experience that it, usually I can get a query down to one millisecond pretty safely if it's using an index, and you know, possibly even faster. So I'm shooting for my really quick lookups uh, on my database to be in that time frame. For more rare queries, if I get a roll up, a report, something that's you know, generating data for a chart, uh, maybe that's 10 milliseconds, 50, 100, that can be reasonable. Maybe even a second, depending on if it's a pretty rich query. So trying to pick apart this explain analyze, there's a few things in here. And it's super unintuitive, but those two dots are actually separating values there. Why they didn't you know, put a comma or something else, a space, I don't know. But what this shows is the startup time on the left there, uh, the overall time for that step, that 295 milliseconds, is that basically that one step in the process, and then how many rows were returned. And then down at the bottom, I've got my total amount of time in milliseconds. So it's 295 milliseconds for this one query. If you've got a slow query, you can basically run this, see how slow it's running, figure out where to start to optimize things. In this case, I can come in, just add an index, because I know I can bring, you know, I should be able to get this down to one millisecond, rerun it, and see that we're at 1.7 milliseconds. So this is if I've got a really specific query that I need to optimize. There's also a uh, Postgres explain plan visualizer. If you search for that in Google, you'll find it. It helps highlight in like red and yellow where some of the bad steps are in the query plan. So this is great if I have a specific query that's bad. I often you know, have people come to me and say, I don't know how good things are or not. Like I've got some slow response times, but I don't know which queries are bad. I don't actually know what's going on. We issue you know, 10,000 different queries across our application. It's been around for 10 years, what's slow? PG stat statements is one of the most useful things uh, in Postgres, hands down. It's an extension that comes with Postgres. You just have to enable it and turn it on. But you should do this for every single database you run. What it's going to do is record every single query that's run against your database. All of these things that I don't fully understand about like how many blocks were dirtied and local versus shared, um, which pages were dirtied, that sort of thing. But the big thing is that it's going to record every query, how many times it was run, how long on average it took. So then I can run this other query based on this. And once you enable the extension, it's just going to keep all of this in the background for you. Now I can come in and say, give me all of my queries that have ever been run against my system, which ones took the longest, say, on average, which ones took the longest in aggregate, and get a really, really nice view here. So now I don't have to go you know, view by view in my application to say, where's this query, where's this query. I can look and say, which things are consuming a lot of load from my, my database. And here, we can apply that same logic knowing, hey, these queries are going in 10 milliseconds and 80 milliseconds on average. Uh, if I can optimize these and bring these down to one millisecond, then I can actually get a lot of resources back to my database. In this case, I'd actually probably start with that second one. If I could bring that 80 milliseconds down to one, I got two orders of magnitude back in terms of performance. All right, so indexes. Um, Postgres has a lot of indexes. There's a group within the Postgres community known as the Russians. Uh, they, they show up with a crazy idea on the mailing list every year or so. They're like, we read this paper. Here's a new index type. Everyone's like, that's crazy. It makes no sense. Um, they kind of disappear for three months and show up with working code that gets committed. Um, so Btree has been around for a long time. Jen is from the Russians, just SPGIS and Bryn. So we have them to tank, thank for a lot of things. And like, I think their day job is like professor of astrophysics at the University of Moscow. They just write index types for fun in Postgres. But if you read through these, it's a little confusing. Like, I, I'm reading through like space partition, generalized search tree, what is this, when do I use it? 
This is slightly oversimplified, but works 99% of the time. So rules of thumb, like B-tree, this is what you learned in CS school. This is usually what you want. When you have like a, a standard set of numbers, like you just want to create, when you do create index, this is what happens. This is usually what you want. Uh, gen index, a generalized inverted index. So the way to think about this is if you have multiple values in one column. If you think of something like an array, right? There's two values there, or three values, or four values in an array. Or if you have something like JSONB, which is you know, a JSON document. Um, HStore is a key value store within Postgres. Range types are useful here, which is a to and from type. Um, so basically, if you have multiple values in a single column, gen indexes are going to index every single key and value or every single value within that, which is really useful. Uh, just indexes. The, the way to think about them is if data kind of overlaps between rows. So if you can think about it like if you have a polygon and you've got row one that, that's one polygon, row two that's one polygon, certain points within those poly polygons can overlap, certain ones are going to be outside. So if you've got data that overlaps between rows in some sense, like full text search or shapes, just indexes are really good. Space partition just, um, I've been told, uh, had it explained to me many, many times, all I know is it's good for phone numbers. Like if you're using phone numbers, use SPGIST. Um, block range indexes is really good for when data naturally clusters together on disk and in some order. So if you can think of like zip codes that start at you know, 001 and go all the way through, but the data naturally clusters together. So you might be looking at like zip code 35802 and 35803 because they're in the same city at the same time. So there, like it's, it's good at sequentially scanning data that naturally clusters together. Uh, there's also a new type coming. Um, so I mentioned the Russians. Uh, we have gin. Apparently vodka is coming because they think because we have gin and they're Russian, we need vodka. I, I hope that's not just a working name. I don't think that's true. I think it's actually going to be called vodka. Um, so a few other index tips. Um, be very specific. So you can just do create index, uh, but you can also have like composite indexes on like uh, email and create it at um, maybe because you know, you want to check if you have multiple users created multiple times. Um, you can have functional indexes. So if you have something like where you're searching based on email and you want to search on lowercase of email so that you don't have to worry about case sensitivity, uh, create your index on that function of the lower value of the email. Um, and then you've got conditional indexes. So if you've got a bunch of data but you only care about some of it, think about like people's addresses and if you're a phone book. You may, not, you may have a history of every place they've ever lived you're probably not frequently querying on that. So you could say where your address is current uh, is equal to true, and it's only going to index that data. So if you've got you know, uh, a nice spread of, hey, I only want to query on this smaller set of my data, it's going to make your index size much smaller. Queries are still going to be efficient. So within Postgres, there's going to be a trade-off, right? Within every database, there's a trade-off. You can have faster writes or faster reads. Um, for every write you make, what's going to happen? It's going to figure out the query plan, write to disk, wait for the acknowledgment, and return. This is going to take you know, about a millisecond on a reasonable size kind of disk. Now as you start adding indexes, it's going to update the index before it returns. It's going to update the index before it returns. And it's going to update the index before it returns. So every index you add is going to slow down writes. The nice thing is uh, you can be pretty flexible, and Postgres can handle quite a few indexes before writes really, really become a bottleneck. You could have 10 indexes on a table and still hit 1,000 writes a second pretty easily, no problem. Um, I recently joked on Twitter of a query that would uh, generate the create index command for every column on every table in your database. Uh, I was kidding, you shouldn't do this. Except for you kind of can. So uh, Postgres has this nice capability to check unused indexes. So when you're worried about, uh, hey, am I slowing down my writes too much, you are aggressive early on in indexes, your application has changed. You can run this query um, to basically say, where are all of my unused indexes at? And this is going to give you the, the number of times it, you know, the, how large it was and how many times it was used. So if you see like a zero over there on index scans, you know, you never use that index. You can come in and drop it. Um, you can also look at, hey, maybe I'm not using it that frequently or I, may, I don't need it. You can start to clean things up. So I would actually say be very, very generous with creating indexes at that kind of early and medium stage. Uh, so on migrations, uh, not null is uh, you know, generally good, except for in a migration, like ensuring we don't have nulls in our database. If you write a default value on a migration, it's going to rewrite the entire table. And this is OK when you're small, right? When you have a 10, gig, uh, 10 gigabyte database, 
rewriting a table is pretty quick. When you have a 100 gigabyte table, that's going to take you, you know, 10 to 45 minutes. And during that time, you're not going to be able to write any data to your database. Um, the proper way to do this, and it's good to get in that habit, kind of that medium stage before you get to a large stage, um, break your migration up into three steps. First, you're going to allow nulls. Set a default value, though. So like all new data that's being written, uh, that'll get that new default value. Gradually go through and backfill 1,000 rows at a time. And then come back in and add your constraint. Um, this is going to allow you to basically keep your database online while you're running a migration in a much better form. All right, so larger scale. Uh, larger scale really, really varies. I've seen you know, Postgres deployments with you know, a petabyte, almost a petabyte of data. Um, so you can get pretty large in a relational database. That's kind of in a clustered setup. On a single node, I've seen several terabytes. I think I've seen as large as 12 terabytes on a single node, still performing pretty well. Um, but large scale can also start as early as 100 gigs of data if you're on the right workload. Uh, a few things there. Uh, create index is going to lock the table while it creates the index. Create index concurrently is going to gradually build up an index in the background, and then as soon as it's live, it's just going to start working. Uh, the downside is create index concurrently doesn't run in a transaction, but you should still just start using this. Um, I know it's like Django migrations, it, you kind of have to work around it, but it's still a good thing to do so you don't bring down production when you're adding an index. Uh, another big thing is connection pooling. Postgres is really not good at uh, connection pooling. Um, or managing a bunch of connections out of the box. So you need to run an additional pooler. Uh, Django now has persistent connections and a connection pooler you can use. Um, SQL Alchemy has had one for a little while. I'd heavily recommend using these. Basically there you're going to have a pool of connections sitting around. When a new request comes into your application, you don't have to grab a new connection, which with things like SSL negotiation can actually take, sometimes in, in cases like 50 milliseconds, to get a connection and then you're running a one millisecond query. So within there, you should have it in the application framework, but there's also the option of doing it on the server side. For the server side, there's a few options here. PG Bouncer and PG Pool. Basically, just use PG Bouncer. Uh, you should run it uh, on, the app, on where the database is, or you can also run it on the application side. It's going to set there, and when you begin a transaction, give you a new connection. When you commit that transaction, release it. Uh, it's going to manage this in a very efficient way. You should start to think about putting something like PG Bouncer in place, probably around 100 connections. As soon as you're at like 500 connections within Postgres, um, bad things can start to happen. Um, and this is for active connections that you really need to be paying attention to. So I mentioned before, when things are slow, like look at that cache hit ratio. When things are slow, throw more memory at it. The easiest thing to do is scale up to a larger instance. At a certain point, you run into a, a brick wall there. Like, there is no bigger instance than you can get on Amazon. I think on RDS, like, the biggest is 240 gigs of RAM. They have a crazy, like, two terabyte X1 machine, but you can't get that on RDS. Um, so at that point, you've got a few options. So one is to offload some of your read traffic to a replica. This is a, a really, really quick fix. Um, there's some nice things about this that you can do earlier on, such as if you have mixed workloads, if you have like BI reporting, because that replica is going to maintain its own cache. So they're going to, you're going to basically have separate caches for your application, which are really, really useful. For replication, there's a whole bunch of tools out there. Um, some of these have been around for maybe 10 years now. To simplify, I would recommend just using Wally or WallG um, or Bar Barman. Uh, Wally is actually written in Python. WallG is the newer version of that in Go. We authored it way back at Heroku. Um, it's used at Heroku to manage something like 2 million databases. We use it at Citus to manage like backups and replication, disaster recovery, all that. So it's very, very battle tested. Uh, Barman is one from second quadrant uh, that's generally pretty good as well. So on the replication side, there's a couple of things you need to think about. Um, it's easy to spin up a read replica, but you need to think about trend, uh, replication lag. So as something's written to one node, how quickly does it get to that read replica for you to query it? That's a thing that can build up and create problems, so you really need to kind of monitor some of that. Um, there was actually a really, really good blog post on Hacker News, if anyone reads it, uh, yesterday, and it may still be on there today right now. Um, if you're thinking about following this setup for replication, I'd heavily encourage looking at it. It's some of the kind of things you need to think through, the caveats. Uh, it's not a trivial thing to do, necessarily. Uh, the other option is sharding. And so sharding, there's a bunch of approaches here. 
uh, you can split up large tables. Uh, if you have a table that's called events, messages, or uh, logs, that's probably the largest table in your database. It probably isn't often joined with the rest of your tables, and you can just archive it to something like Dynamo or Cassandra. Um, the other option is to start to split up data by customer and essentially shard it. There's a few approaches to this. Um, you can use like one database per customer, one schema per customer, or sharding within your application. Um, for the scalable options, I would basically say like you can split out large tables, or you do that multi-tenant level sharding, which is uh, within your application. Don't do one schema per customer or one database per customer. It works really great when you have like 100 customers. At something like 1,000, backups just stop working because we didn't need them. Um, Postgres is getting better about lots and lots of schemas and lots and lots of databases, but it's still not perfect. Then you have to think also about like how do I run migrations. Now I've got to run migrations not for one database, but for thousands. Um, one option here is to like manually roll your own. So uh, I think there's some inter interesting posts from Instagram, from Braintree of how they rolled their own. Another option is Citus. Citus is just like a pure extension to Postgres. Um, you still talk to one database, but under the cover you're running multiple physical ones. So to your application, it just looks like a single node Postgres database. Uh, under the covers, there's multiple physical databases and queries being routed appropriately there. Um, it's like an open source extension. We also run a database as a service, so you can just download it and use it yourself. All right, backups. Um, backups, make sure you have them, test them. There's two different types of backups. So there's logical backups, which is what you get when you do PG dump. That's like the SQL insert statements. Um, there's some nice things to it. It's human readable, it's portable. Um, the other option is a physical backup. This is using something like Barman or Wally or WallG, and this is the physical bytes on disk. So you can't take this from like an Amazon certain image down to your local uh, development environment. So there's some limitations to it. Uh, but there's some really nice things about it. So logical backups work really, really well when you're early on. At some scale, they'll start to fail. When you're at 100 gigs, 500 gigs, a terabyte, um, you're basically going to have to move away from them. Physical backups have much, much less load on the database, uh, and you can scale them pretty infinitely. So at somewhere between that middle and large stage, you're going to want to sw swap from going from PG dump to something like uh, physical backups. All right, I'm going to skip over this for time. All right, really quick recap. Um, so small databases uh, really, really leverage your, da your data types. Um, it's not a dumb hash. Postgres has a lot of rich features. Um, leverage full text search, leverage geospatial, leverage JSONB, leverage all those things early on. Um, it gives you nice performance benefits later on as well. And when you're small, you have the chance to kind of invest there. Uh, do te test your backups, um, and then take time to uh, learn your tools. Like, spend time with psql, spend time with just Postgres and its functionality, and you'll be better off later on. Um, for medium scale, make sure your Postgres is well-tuned. Um, for small scale, it matters less. At larger scale, um, look at PostgreSQL when it's not your day job, or trust someone else to do it. Trust RDS, trust Heroku Postgres, trust someone like Citus, like that we have you know, committers on staff that are making sure things are set up properly for you. Watch your cache hit ratios, ratio. Um, I usually check this on a every two week basis to see when things start to drop. When it goes from 99% to 98%, query times will go from like one millisecond to like 50. So you basically kind of fall off a cliff when you go beyond that 99%. And then feel free to be really generous with indexes. Um, for large scale, move away from PG dump. It's going to introduce load on your database that you just don't need. Um, set up connection pooling. You can start to do this kind of at medium scale, but you'll really want it at large scale. Um, and if you need to, to shard, invest in doing it the right way that lasts long term. If you go with something like the one database per customer model, That'll work for six months or a year, and then you're going to kind of be back where you started. All right, that's all. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm out of time, but I'll hang around in the back for questions.